When I was growing up, my mother used to make a mean chili. I distinctly remember it had uh, all the, the right things. It was the perfect ratio of uh, bean to meat to tomato consistency. You know what I'm talking about? It's key. It's important. Good aroma, bold flavor, just the right amount of kick. Her chili was just really, really good. Now, I couldn't tell you her recipe exactly. My mother was the type of person where her recipes were all in her head. And so she would cook that way. But she had a recipe, but it was in her head. And so I can't tell you everything that she had in there, but I can tell you one of the things I distinctly remember she would put in there was she would put a, a decent amount of chili powder, right? That was what helped give it the kick that we all love so much. Well, on one occasion, however, when she was making that chili, she had a little mix-up in the kitchen. I was younger. I remember this pretty distinctly, though. And instead of adding a hefty amount of chili powder, she added a hefty amount of cinnamon. Okay. She, didn't, she didn't know it, but she did. So I'm not sure you can quite imagine what this tastes like, by the way. I, I heard a little bit of a, oh, you know, from you guys when I said that. But take my word for it. It was terrible. I mean, the chili was really just wretched. It was terrible. I don't even know if the trash can deserved to have that chili. It was that bad because there was no cake. It was all just an abundance of cinnamon and, uh, yeah. Now, attempting to be a good son and trying as a family to, to support my mother, we all started by eating and we tried to have a, a brave face. After that first bite, we realized it wasn't her normal chili. And so we all tried to choke, choke it down until eventually the anguish of how terrible it tasted, it finally reached a boiling point and someone piped up. It might have been my father, I can't remember. I don't know what's up with this chili, but it's not the same. It tastes terrible. Now, my mother knew that she, she had messed something up. At first, we were kind of like, oh, what's different this time? You know, and she was kind of going, I don't know. I think it was the same. We eventually realized it was the, the cinnamon. But as a kid, we were encouraged to always eat what was in front of us. But this time, there was unanimous consensus at the table. This, this, this was unfit for human consumption. We weren't going to eat the chili, and so we moved on to something else. Now, I tell you this story. I opened up with a story about chili uh, this morning because it illustrates a basic principle this morning that we're going to see from God's word, and it's this. There's a direct correlation between using the wrong ingredients and experiencing bad results. Now, we're not talking about cooking today, just so you know. I don't know if anybody's disappointed with that. I'm not giving uh, Joseph's tips on cooking. Uh, we're actually going to be talking specifically about the recipe of our faith and how that relates to the way that we live this morning. You see, we, we need to have a, a good handle on the gospel. We need to have a good handle on the truth. We need to know the right ingredients of the gospel. And usually, when we have that right, it's clearly evident in the way that we live, the way that we act. And in the church, this is even more important. We need both the right ingredients, the right recipe, and the right results. So that's going to be our focus today. We're going to look at the life of the church. We're going to talk about leadership today in the church. And uh, so you can go ahead and open your Bibles to Titus chapter 1. The book of Titus, chapter 1. I usually mention this, but if you came here today and you didn't bring a Bible, uh, you can use the seatback Bibles in front of us. If you don't have a Bible at home, just take the seatback Bible home as our free gift to you as well. Uh, we just say if you're going to take it, we'd like you to use it. That would be great. Uh, you can also download our free mobile app. Our mobile app has uh, a lot of great uh, resources in it as well as the little handout that you have that you can follow along this morning. That's also in there. You can utilize that, and there's a Bible there as well. So lots of options. And as you're turning to the book of Titus, I just want to remind you that we're beginning this pulpit swap series. It was in your bulletin, and uh, we're briefly moving through the book of Titus. We're actually going to attempt to go through the book of Titus, kind of in a survey. Uh, at least the, my goal was to try to just survey through the first chapter. The other guys might just pick a section in three weeks, which is very ambitious. It's a very, uh, very lofty goal. And our series is called Living the Good Life. Living the Good Life. And so this morning, I have the privilege of kicking off chapter one, and then of course, the next couple weeks in chapter two, you're going to have uh, Dr. Mark Hazen is going to share, and then the last chapter, uh, you'll have Ben Glupker is going to share, Pastor Ben Glupker is going to share, and so what I'm doing is I'm, over after this week, I'm rotating in their churches uh, for two weeks in a row, kicking off the series in each of their churches, and so we're just going to kind of do that rotation and work our way through, and I'm excited about the series. I love that we can do this together. It's an enjoyable thing for me. And uh, looking forward to uh, hearing their messages as well, and I hope it's a blessing for you. Uh, love those guys. They'll do a great job. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Titus chapter 1. I'm going to start by reading the introduction. So let's, let's hear now God's word. This is the introduction to the book of Titus. It says, Paul, 
a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Now this is the introduction. And let me just say, if you ever read all of Paul's introductions, this is perhaps one of the most robust introductions of any of his epistles. So this is a big introduction, and we're only going to just touch on a couple things in a second. But let me just say, after we're looking at this introduction, we see that the author is the Apostle Paul, and he is writing this book to Titus. Titus is his young co-laborer in the gospel, and he affectionately calls him his true child in the common faith we see here. Now, remember, Titus is this guy, he's a young Gentile Christian whom Paul used in ministry quite frequently. In fact, if you were with us for all of 2017, any of the Sundays we had other than, I guess, last Sunday and the first Sunday, you knew that we were going through the book of Galatians, this series called No Other Gospel. And in the book of Galatians, Titus is actually mentioned at one point in chapter 2. Remember, he was the guy that Paul mentions, and he's using Titus as the example of the freedom they have in Christ because Titus was uncircumcised. And remember, they were in Jerusalem. Paul traveled there, and Titus was with him. And so Titus was a believer, a minister of the gospel, yet he was uncircumcised. And so the, the whole point there was there were people who were trying to pressure Titus into becoming circumcised. Remember, Paul said, no, we didn't even yield, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be upheld. That was, that was the Titus of Galatians chapter 2. We also know a few other things about Titus. He's mentioned uh, just in Paul's epistles, but we know he's also mentioned in the books of uh, Corinthians. So he's familiar with challenging ministry because Paul sent him to work in Corinth. And if you know anything about the Corinthians, man, that was a messed up church. I don't know how many of you have ever been to churches that had a lot of drama and challenge. Well, that, that ain't nothing compared to Corinth. And so Titus was there as a young man serving there. And now here in our letter, which takes place later, he's recently arrived on the island of Crete. In the Mediterranean, there's a very large island called Crete. And he is entrusted with the task of serving within the local churches on the island that have been established there. And so in the book of Titus, Paul is writing to a young man and friend this letter of guidance and instruction for this new ministry in Crete. And I just want to take a moment real quickly to say this. Every Titus needs a Paul. Every Titus needs a Paul. I'll speak for myself, for me personally, as a young man in ministry. Don't let the gray hair fool you. I'm still pretty young. I desperately need older people, older pastors to speak into my life. Older people who've been experienced with ministry. And one more quick plug for this Pulpit Swap series. If you're thinking, you know, I'm just going to check out this church this week and then I'm going to go somewhere else next week. I'm trying to give you a plug to come back next week and the following week. The two guys who are going to be preaching, I thoroughly consider the Pauls in my life. Uh, these men have poured into me. These men have helped me. They've encouraged me. They've guided me uh, in moments where I was over my head, which is pretty much 87% of my entire life in ministry. These guys have spoken in and helped me and encouraged me and built me up. And uh, I consider these guys Paul's. And so I can't tell you how much I've appreciated them and uh, love and respect these guys. And I really want you to come back, if you can't tell. I really want you to come and hear these guys speak. They're going to kill it in the pulpit. I guarantee it. Uh, hopefully you still want me back by the time they're done. But uh, it's going to be great. So come back over the next two weeks. All right, back to our book. So here in this letter, Paul is writing to Titus. And in his introduction, he mentions something that I think is really key for us this morning. In fact, it's key for the whole series, but in particular for our first chapter. Something that Paul says in the very first verse. He says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect. And hear this. And their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. Their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. You see, at the end of this verse, Paul reveals something that's key to understanding the theme of this book. And in particular, this chapter, as I mentioned, it's this. There's an inseparable link between faith and practice. There's a connection between knowing the truth of God's word and living the good life. 
living a life that accords with godliness. Another way we could say it would be this. When people truly have a good handle on God's word and on the gospel, it should be evident by the way that they live their lives. If you're the type of person who you're reading mechanically the words of scripture and they're only going to your brain and that word is never traveling to your heart and the Holy Spirit's never working on you, you are not reading scripture. You're not interpreting scripture rightly. The word of God changes us and transforms us. It's a call to action that we change and that we live different lives. And good theology and godly living, they cannot and should not be divorced, especially when it comes to leadership in the church. So this is the focus of our text. This morning we're taking time to focus on the kinds of leaders that God is calling for us to have here at Frankenmuth Bible Church. And so our big idea this morning is this. And if you have your little handout, whether you're using our app or you're using the piece of paper, you can fill us out here. This is the big idea. The standard for leadership in the church is knowing the truth and living the good life. The standard for leadership in the church is knowing the truth and living the good life. This is our standard. This is the calling that God has given to us. We need leaders here at this church who both know and can teach the truth of God's word and demonstrate that truth by the way they live. And so we're going to see Paul... Right out of the gate, he's going to explain this. So that little first verse, that's a little foreshadowing to the entire book, what he's going to talk about. So let's now look at verse 5. Paul gives some very practical instructions to this young man who's in over his head, probably, in uh, these churches in Crete. Paul says this to Titus. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So there's two key things that need to be accomplished. First, Paul mentions something that's currently established in those churches that's disorderly. There's something there that he needs to put in order. And so Titus is being commissioned to take care of something that's currently existing in those churches that ain't quite right. And he's going to talk about this in verses 10 through 16. But before that, Paul is going to address at length something else, something that isn't established in those churches that needs to be created or established. The churches in Crete, they have a lack of leaders. They need elders in those churches. So Titus' twofold task begins with this. Number one, again in your handout, creating new order in the church by establishing good leadership. This is his first task, creating new order in the church by establishing good leadership. Leadership. In order for the church in Crete to be successful, it needs to be structured in the right way. It needs elders. Now, for some of you, maybe you come from different church backgrounds, and the word elder maybe is confusing to you. Uh, here at FBC, we hold to uh, an elder-led model where we believe that, uh, that God has uh, pretty clearly spelled out in his word uh, that the priority in terms of church leadership rests on biblical eldership. That's the primary focal point for church leadership. Uh, it's our model, and Uh, we don't really have time again to go into at length all the details about what an elder is. That's a whole separate Sunday, okay? I'm trying to move my way through an entire chapter. But let me just say, an elder, as described in Scripture, is one of a plurality of biblically qualified men who jointly shepherd and oversee a local body of believers. These are the men who pastor uh, specific local churches. And so I use the word pastor, if you notice there, because the word elder and pastor... In the Bible, they're used synonymously. And so here at this church, we have a board of elders. I'm the lead pastor here, but we have a board of elders, and biblically, these guys are considered as pastors. These are the qualifications they need to have. They're pastors. Now, there's some delineation. We can get to the nuanced aspects of when Scripture talks about paid staff who are primarily responsible for preaching and teaching. There is an emphasis there as well. But the office of elder, these are pastors, And on the island of Crete, they're in desperate need of pastors or elders who can step up in these churches. And so Paul is telling Titus, hey man, you've got to find the right guys for these churches. They're floundering over here. You've got to put the right guys into positions of leadership. So the question that naturally Titus would ask is, well, what kind of leaders? What kind of leaders am I supposed to put in this role? And Paul is answering this for Titus right here now in verses 6 through 8. So let's read verses 6 through 8. Paul lays this out. If anyone's above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. 
For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. So here in verses 6 through 8, what kind of leaders are described? Well, the first thing that Paul says is this, those who practice godliness. This is the first thing. Those who practice godliness. These are the kinds of men who love their wives. Now, there's a whole lot of, well, again, we can go into separate stuff when people read this, the husband of one wife, is that they're talking about multiple wives or, some, or things like that. I, I think it predominantly talks about a one-woman man, right? Not a womanizer, a guy who's devoted to his wife, and that's it. So a guy who loves his wife the way he should, a guy who leads his family well. These are guys who have a good reputation in the community. They're humble. They treat people the right way. They're in control of themselves and their behaviors. These are guys who are living the good life. Living the good life. And this is the standard we have for leadership in the church. Hear this for a second. As a church, we are to watch the people around us. We are to watch our leaders and judge whether or not the way that they live is truly worthy of being in that position of leadership. Now, for some people, you might go, well, hold on, I thought we're not really supposed to judge. That kind of sounds really harsh. You're, you're judging people? Yeah, yeah, we are. That's what we're called to do. There are times where we're supposed to judge. We're supposed to discern. If someone is completely living opposed to all the stuff that they preach or teach, if someone is completely has the worst reputation in the community and they're living completely inconsistent with the gospel that we declare and the word of God that we preach and teach, how could they possibly be a good leader? That's a big problem. Their lifestyle needs to match what we preach and teach. There's a disconnect if it's there because as a believer, we should be bearing good fruit. We should be living godly lives. We should be living the good life if we're truly in Christ. And if we're not, maybe we need to question whether or not we're connected to the right root. In fact, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. And if we're truly believers, we will bear good fruit. We'll be living lives that are changed and transformed. There's a correlation between how we live and our understanding of the truth and our understanding of the gospel. If the chili tastes bad, someone's probably adding the wrong ingredients. You know what I'm saying? If the end result, if the life looks bad, there must be a mix-up or a disconnect somewhere in there. Someone messed up the recipe. So biblically, we see that it's essential for leaders to live the good life. And notice how Paul mentions twice the need to be above reproach. Two separate times he mentions this. Now just so you know, a little hermeneutical, which is how you study the Bible, tactic here. Anytime you see repetition in the Bible, that's, a, that's a, a biblical way of emphasizing something. Repetition is emphasis. So Paul uses this twice, above reproach. There's an emphasis, emphasis on the reputation of leaders here because our conduct has a profound effect on the testimony of other people. We need to recognize that unbelievers are watching us. If our leaders are living terribly, what kind of testimony is that? People are watching us. In fact, people are usually far more impacted by not what we say, but how we live. There's a quote uh, by St. Francis of Assisi that says, Preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. Let me just say for a second, I kind of don't like this quote for two reasons. There's part of it I like. Number one, St. Francis actually never said this. So if you hear people quote, quote this, oh, St. Francis said this. He actually didn't. So that's been proven historically. Secondly, I do believe that if you're going to preach the gospel, you have to use words. Read Romans 10, 14. How will they hear unless someone preaches? And someone needs to be sent. There needs to be laborers out into the harvest. We can't just go around being nice to people and thinking somehow our niceness will rub off and they'll become magically believers never hearing the gospel. It doesn't work that way. We need to preach the gospel. Part of evangelism, I hope in this church that we begin to take more and more ownership as individuals of evangelism, is not just shaking people's hands and giving them a smile and thinking that somehow they're magically going to be converted. We at some point need to communicate the truth of the gospel, that Jesus Christ gave his life for us, took our place on the cross, was raised from the dead, and through faith in Jesus we can find salvation. At some point we need to communicate this, okay? But I'm going to give... 
you know, a little, let me just say this. This quote, I think what they're trying to communicate is this. The way that we live, it preaches something, right? It preaches something profound. And so I'm not completely disowning the quote. I think there are aspects of it we can retain. How we live, it preaches. It communicates something to other people. And so as a church, we need to seriously consider the standard of godly living when it comes to leadership, appointing elders. So this isn't something that should be overlooked. And then notice here now, in verse 9, what does Paul say in verse 9? Again, he's talking about the qualifications for the elders that Titus is supposed to appoint. Paul says, He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. So the second characteristic of good leadership would be this, number two, those who preach the gospel. We see those who practice godliness, those who preach the gospel. Paul is describing men who know the truth, who can articulate the truth and rightly handle it, who can teach, who know all the right ingredients of scripture to use, and who can also refute those who are messing up the recipe. This is the kind of leaders that that Paul is calling for Titus to have. This is the standard for elders. These are the men that he needs to have raised up to lead the church. And the reality is these are the kinds of men we need at Frankenmuth Bible Church. We need men who both know the truth, can communicate that truth, and who live that truth out. This is the standard, and it's a high standard. And so the push this morning is let's not grow complacent. Let's not lower the bar. Let's keep that bar high. Let's find men in leadership who pass the test when it comes to doctrine and deed, when it comes to belief and behavior, when it comes to creed and conduct, who have the right knowledge and the right action. Both aspects are important. This is the biblical standard. That means it's challenging at times. That means when it comes time every year, we do this thing in in this church here where we uh, have a a season where we begin finding people that we feel like could be uh, worthy to, to, to be in the elder room, and so we kind of go through this whole process. That means that when it comes time this year for that, we need to seriously think these factors. Does this person know the truth? Can they articulate the truth? And not only that, are they living rightly? We need to keep the standard high. Not only that, though, here's the other thing this means practically. Not only do we need to find the right people, we need to be proactive about raising up young men in this church to lead. And that responsibility falls on all of us. Parents, you have a profound opportunity to instruct and raise, especially young men, your boys, to know, to love, and to follow Jesus. Don't miss out on that opportunity. I've I've got a daughter who's going to turn six this summer, and I don't know even what happened to those six years. It was like a blink, and that was it. And I'm sure for those of you who went through this process, you know how fast this happens. Parents, now is the time. Let's start discipling our children, raising them up, raising up young men who can take over and and take on a leadership role in the future. So Titus chapter 1 is a call for strong discipleship in the church. It's a big task for Titus, and it's an equally big task, I think, for us at FBC. So his first task we see in our passage is this. It's the need to... Uh, for creating new order in the church by establishing good leadership. But the second thing we're going to see Paul say is this, correcting disorder in the church by eliminating bad leadership. See, the churches of Crete had a big problem. There were some people who were in leadership roles who were not doing their job well. Now, I don't think they were formally appointed as elders. I think there was a group of people who were very influential, who had big mouths, who liked to sway people, who were often disruptive, and they kind of worked their way into prominent roles within those churches. And so the question for Titus is, hey, what kind, of, what kind of leaders do I need to deal with? Who are the problem people? And notice what Paul says. It says, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and to the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. So what kind of leaders are we talking about here? Well, the first thing we see... Those who preach deception. Those who preach 
deception. These leaders are the kind of guys who don't have a good handle on the truth. They're messing up all the ingredients. They shouldn't be in the kitchen in the first place. They're the ones who tend to add cinnamon instead of chili powder, teaching all kinds of things that are contrary to the word of God that are not consistent with scripture. And according to Paul's description of these people, it seems like these guys are probably very closely related to the kinds of people we saw in Galatia. He talks about the circumcision party. He talks about uh, Jewish myths and things like this. So it's, it seems like, on one hand, these Cretan leaders who are there who are peddling this false gospel, they're fixated on a works-based salvation. They're peddling a Jesus plus something else kind of gospel for selfish gain. And so Paul says, this is not acceptable. And not only are they legalistic, but they're probably also dabbling in some syncretism because the people in Crete were really into uh, mythologies and things like that. And so it seems like with what's said here, maybe they're both legalistic, but they're also into some of the local beliefs talks about liars, things like that, belief in various legends. And so imagine the damage of having false teachers in a church in a place like Crete, and, and they have no good elders. They have no established elders. Imagine the damage that might have been done for these people. And in fact, it says whole families are being messed up. Upsetting whole families, Paul says. It's a bad situation. So Paul ends by saying both their minds and their consciences are defiled. These guys are completely unfit for the office of elder. They don't speak the truth. And as I mentioned before, if you add the wrong ingredients, what happens? Well, the result is never very good either. And we see this as Paul continues. These guys need to be silenced and corrected and removed from their positions of influence because we're going to see that their lives also don't reflect the truth of the gospel. Notice what Paul says in verse 16. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. So secondly, these bad leaders are described as those who practice disobedience. Those who practice disobedience. Both in word and deed, these guys are bad news. And they got to go. As I mentioned, there's a direct correlation between using the wrong ingredients, teaching a false gospel, and experiencing bad results because they're not living the good life. They're not living consistent with that gospel. These things go hand in hand. And so we're going to begin to wrap up this morning. And I guess I just have two practical things I kind of want to push this morning on our congregation. All right? So if I begin to lose you at any point today, let's reel it in. Two practical things. What's our big idea? It's this. The standard for leadership in the church is knowing the truth and living the good life. The standard is both knowing what's true about God's word and living it out. And so the first challenge I want to make this morning is this. Are we willing to hold this standard at this church? Do we have a standard at this church and are we willing to hold to it? This specific standard. Are we willing to take this on? Are we willing to put in the hard work to ensure that we have leaders who are truly living this out and who know God's word? Are we we truly going to make sure that we're willing to, to have these people know God's word and live it out? Or are we going to be afraid or complacent? Or are we going to try to be polite to people and we're just going to choke this stuff down, right? Oh, well, you know, he tries hard. This guy over here, he's probably not qualified to be a leader, but I feel bad for him, so let's just put him in that position. Are we going to hold to the standard or not? Beloved, if the chili tastes bad, don't eat it. That's the point. This guy looks really miserable. This is me, like 20 years ago. If the chili tastes bad, don't eat it. If it tastes like cinnamon, throw it out. It's not fit for consumption. I don't care if it's convenient. I don't care if the guy probably could use a boost in his ego. If he doesn't have the qualifications, let's hold the standard. This is the point. Let's have high standards as a church. I don't care if it's all we got. Let's keep the standard high. That's an excuse at times. Let's not lower the bar. Let's have leaders who know and live out the truth. Let's not settle by being complacent or or convenient. The standard for leadership in the church is knowing the truth and living the good life. And the second thing I just want to ask is this. How do we measure up? It doesn't matter if you're a woman or a man in here. I'm not talking about specifically about pursuing that role in general. There's a principle at play in the book of Titus, and it's this. We know the truth, we live the truth. 
Next week, you're going to hear about knowing the truth and living the truth and, and discipleship and family situations. And the last week, you're going to hear about it in the world. My task specifically was to talk about in the church, in leadership, knowing the truth and living the truth. So the general question is, how do we measure up? Are you growing in God's word? Are you diving into the scriptures? I'm not trying to be legalistic about this. I'm just saying part of being a Christian means that we're growing. And it's not enough just to come here on Sunday morning. I, don't put that pressure on me. I don't want that pressure. Are you growing in God's word? Are you learning? Are you finding opportunities to, 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 to take more truth and to try to bring it into your mind and have that reach to your heart so it begins to change the way that you live? Is your life changing? When did you become a Christian? Are you different today from that point? If you're not, that's not good news. I hope that you're growing. I hope that you're changing. I hope that God's working in your heart. I hope he's working in my heart. Are you living the good life today? How do you measure up? This is the challenge to us. And this should be convicting. I tell you what, just one last little thing and then we'll, we'll be done. We often talk in the elder room about reading those qualifications, how hard it is. Do we measure up? The things that he's talking about, about arrogance and about being self-seeking, all those different things, anger, stuff like that. We often talk about the fact that, man, it, reading those qualifications, it's heavy. Where do we measure up? Are we living the good life? By God's grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray that we will be increasingly growing in our understanding of truth and so we can live lives that reflect the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning and just the opportunity we have, again, to just come to your word and to see this truth from Scripture, Father. I pray that you would just uh, use this truth this morning, Father, in this church to just remind us about the standards, Father. To remind us about what it means to be taking on a leadership position, Father. This is not something you even said in your word that uh, there are specific roles and responsibilities that not everybody should try to take on because... Often those who are put in positions of leadership, they're going to be judged on the day of judgment to a higher degree of standard, Father. And we just, we ask this morning that we would not grow complacent. We ask as a church that we would not choose what's convenient, that we wouldn't try to spare feelings necessarily, but Father, that we would hold fast to your standards. And, and Lord, we would think through the qualifications for leadership according to what your word declares that we would have high standards, Father, for those that we put into positions of leadership, Father. And for our, ourselves, I, I just pray that you would just work in our hearts and minds, Father. I pray that you would work on us so that way we would know truth and we would live truth. And so we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to grow and learn. I just pray also, Father, just for the next couple of weeks as uh, these other guys come in and, and preach, I just pray that this would be a profound opportunity uh, to hear some different voices to really speak into what it means to know and to live according to the gospel. So I just pray that you would just bless those guys in their time here as well. And thank you again for this church and all that you're doing here. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand.